Welcome back. We are all familiar with real numbers from our daily lives. So let's consider the positive real number line. In this we have the integers such as positive 1, 2 and 3. We also have rational numbers such as a half and 3 quarters. But we also have irrational numbers such as e and pi. Now what happens when we extend the positive real number line in the negative direction? Well, we're going to get negative integers such as minus 1 and minus 3. We're also going to get negative rational numbers and negative irrational numbers. Note that the building block for the real number line is the square root of plus 1, which is simply 1. So looking at our real number line, we have positive 1 times the square root of 1. We have e times the square root of 1. We have negative 2 times the square root of 1. The thing is, though, that the real number line doesn't account for or allow us to discuss the square root of a negative number. And that poses the question, what is the square root of minus 1? Well, it turns out that the real numbers we are all familiar with aren't the most general type of number. And we refer to the most general type of number as a complex number. And complex numbers have two components a real component, so something coming from the real number line, and something we're calling imaginary numbers. And that hints at the concept of an imaginary number line. So a complex number has both real numbers and what we're calling imaginary numbers. To be clear though, although we're using this almost strange terminology imaginary, imaginary numbers are no less real in the mathematical sense. What we're calling imaginary numbers actually exist, and they're not just a mathematical construct in order for us to do mathematical manipulations. So, the square root of plus 1 is the building block for the real numbers, and the square root of negative 1 is the building block for the imaginary numbers. And once again, the terminology real and imaginary isn't very good, so unfortunately we'll have to go with it because that's what it is. We use the placeholder z for an arbitrary complex number. It has two components, a real and an imaginary component. And it's given as the square root of plus 1 times the magnitude of the real component. And it's given as the square root of negative 1 multiplied by the magnitude of the imaginary component. And we give the placeholder x for the real component and the placeholder y for the imaginary component. And the square root of plus 1 is 1, of course. So usually we actually don't explicitly write this down. We say that its z is x plus the square root of 1 times y. Excuse me, the square root of minus 1 times y. So just because in our daily lives we are most familiar with real numbers, that's not a sufficient reason to believe that only real numbers exist. There is no particular reason to think that just real numbers exist because we are used to them in our daily lives. So, I'll ask that you accept that the most general type of number is a complex number, and that it has two components, a real component and an imaginary component. That the building block for the real component is the square root of plus 1, and the building block for the imaginary component is the square root of minus 1. But that, in our daily lives, it happens that the imaginary component is usually 0, but that in science, engineering and mathematics, Actually, the imaginary component is very regularly non-zero. So, consider a complex number z whose imaginary component is zero. In other words, it has no imaginary component, and z, therefore, is simply x, which is the real component. This, of course, is something which is going to live on the real number line. So, where the imaginary component y is zero, we live on a line. So by extension, when y is non-zero and x is non-zero, we are going to go from a line to a plane. We'll be living in 2D space. And very often, the numbers involved in science, engineering and mathematics actually live on this infinite number plane. They don't simply live on the real number line, however they live on the complex plane. So, in those circumstances, our arbitrary complex number z 
is given as x plus the square root of negative 1 times y. And the square root of negative 1 is so important we actually give it its own placeholder. And it's the Greek letter iota. So z is x plus iota times y or x plus i times y. So we have seen that a complex number has two components. And it lives in the infinite number plane. So the 2D plane used to represent the infinite numbers of, of complex numbers is actually known as an Argand diagram. As I said, when the imaginary component is zero, when the y is zero, we are simply going to live on the real number line. Clearly, of course, the imaginary number line is perpendicular to the real number line, and its building block, block excuse me, is the square root of negative one, or iota. So the arbitrary complex number z can live anywhere or exist anywhere on the infinite number plane. So if we consider this complex number here, then its x component or its real component is going to correspond to this section of the real number line, whereas its imaginary component is going to correspond to this section of the imaginary number line. In this case, x is approximately two and y is approximately 3. So z is approximately 2 plus iota times 3. Clearly we can define the angle theta here and this hints at using the Pythagoras theorem. Clearly when theta is equal to 0 then the complex number comes down onto the real number line and the complex number becomes the real number line. Conversely when theta is 90 degrees, well then our complex number actually exists only on the imaginary number line. And in science, engineering and mathematics, it is very often the case that theta is neither zero or 90 degrees or the other equivalents, and hence the complex number lives somewhere on the plane as opposed to on one of the two axes. Using the Pythagoras theorem, we can re-express the, the imaginary component and the real component using cosines and sines. So if we say that the magnitude of the complex number is a, then the real component is a cosine theta, and the imaginary component is a sine theta. So whether you express your complex number in the rectangular coordinate system of x plus iota times y, or in the polar system using cosines and sines, is actually just down to mathematical convenience and the situation you are dealing with at the time. To be specific, we can represent the arbitrary complex number z as a, its magnitude of cosine theta plus iota times sine theta, or in the rectangular coordinate system of x plus iota times y. So, that concludes this section, and in the next section I'm going to derive the Euler equation. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next section.